I'm the uh, Dean of Academics here at the Institute of War Politics. For those of you who don't know about IWP, we are an independent graduate school, National Security Affairs. We have a total of five um, uh, master's program, MA programs, 18 certificates, and we have a new uh, professional doctorate. So anybody who is interested or knows somebody who might be interested in that kind of graduate school, uh, feel free to address one of us as we get underway. We're very fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Wayne Lee from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he's the Dow Distinguished Professor of History, and also where he chairs the Curriculum in Peace, War, and Defense. He's got a few books to his name. Waging War, Conflict, Culture, and Innovation in World History, which was published in 2016. Barbarians and Brothers, Anglo-American Warfare from 1500 to 1865. And Crowds and Soldiers in Revolutionary North Carolina, 2001. In addition, he has two edited volumes on world military history. Now, you'd think that would be enough. But I think what we have here is kind of an overachiever who likes to make the rest of us look bad because he also is an anthropologist, having done the field work in Greece, Albania, Hungary, Croatia, and Virginia, and uh, which included co directing two field projects. And he was the, again, principal author and co editor of Light and Shadow. Isolation and Interaction in the Shallow Valley of Northeastern, um, sorry, Northern Albania, which won a book award in 2014 for the American Archaeology Association. And uh, in his spare time, in 2015-16, he held the Harold K. Uh, Johnson Visiting Professorship for Military History at the U.S. Army War College in Cairo, uh, Pennsylvania. So, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wayne Lee. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. And thanks to all the staff at the IVP and to Danielle in particular, who managed all of my logistics, um, which were complicated because of weather and wind and snows and things like that. Uh, I want to start by referring to an event that everybody probably here is familiar with. Uh, I'm solo. I'm now increasingly terrified at the fact that many of my students were barely alive in 2003 when the invasion of Iraq fell apart um, and turned into a, a kind of failure to understand what consolidating gains means and how to go about doing it. And I started thinking about the fact, recently I started thinking about the fact, in, in conjunction with this larger project, I started thinking about the fact that in the United States military, especially in the professional military education sphere, at whatever level, whether it's cadets or colonels, or generals even, I've done some for generals as well, we have a very well-developed culture of the staff ride, which we take people out and show them battlefields and we discuss, you know, hopefully not tactics, but at least operations and strategy. Why, why are they here? What are they hoping to accomplish? Um, and this is an old tradition. If we think about German military culture in the 19th century being deeply influenced by their own sort of study of Kanai and Hannibal's victory over the Romans and how that influenced the way they thought about warfare. For us, I would like to think we have the Gettysburg sort of monkey on our back. I mean, every officer in the army has been to Gettysburg probably twice and <laughs> done the whole thing with why did they come up this road, why did they go down that road, why are they on this hill. And it occurred to me, again, in conjunction with this project, that you know, that's not a bad thing. I'm not trying to critique that at all. But what we don't have is a similar or parallel intellectual genre or experience for post-combat consolidation. What do you do when you win? There's no staff ride for occupying Baghdad. There probably should be. We could do it. Uh, but there is no equivalent staff ride, nor is there an equivalent intellectual genre. Uh, I actually had the experience of sitting in, the, in a panel at the Society for Military History Conference last year, and there were three papers uh, presenting on the history of U.S. Army occupations, one in Mexico, one in Puerto Rico after the Spanish-American War, and I said, I don't remember where the other one was. But during the q and I raised my hand, I said, did any, all three of you working on the, rough, the same genre of, of sort of history in military affairs and military activity and occupation duty, did, did any of you have any sort of theoretical, theoretical literature to build from? And they all said, uh, no. Uh, the only thing that sort of talked about this at a theoretical level was the Army Counterinsurgency Manual. 
and I slapped my head and moved on and further motivated to do this project. And then a couple of weeks ago, already planning to come up here, um, sort of in my feed I saw that the uh, Army was deploying its first Security Force Assistance Brigade to Afghanistan. And so I started poking around. I wonder, okay, that's cool. Uh, that's an old idea. Now we're actually doing it. What does it look like? Or is, it, is, it, is its existence being taught at the War College where I had just recently been teaching? So I called up my colleagues at the War College who are still there, and I said, is, is the SFAB, the Security Force Assistance Brigade, is the SFAB in the curriculum yet? And my, fr my friend who said, I don't know, let me go check. And so she went down the hall to the people who teach theater strategic campaign planning. And she was told, well, the SFABs might have been mentioned, but they're below the strategic level. And I, again, slapped my head and said, <laughs> if there is anything that is above, or at least at the strategic level, it's what do you do after you win? And how do you make it stick? And so this project uh, is sort of directed towards that intellectual genre. Now, I mean, as you're going to see, all my details are way before the present. But it's part of an effort to build an edifice of how do we think about these problems. And it emerged from several different things. It emerged from different projects that I've been working on. And not least, it emerged from a conversation I had with General McMaster a couple of years ago, in which he said, was lamenting to me the lack of a doctrine in the Army for his phrase, the consolidation of gains. Um, notice I don't use that phrase. I'm using reaping the reward. <laughs> Because for the period of history that I'm going to look at, people didn't talk about consolidating gains. They talked about what do we get out of this? What does victory bring us? And then how do we secure that victory? Now, in addition, one of the other threads that led me to this is I'm someone who's trying to do world military history, not American or European. And I want to do it in a way that moves beyond Western or even state-centric paradigms. I want to talk about how do non-states in world history perceive gains or, and consolidate gains or try to hold on to whatever it is that they've won. And that's significant in part because most of world history has seen a broad mix of society types that are competing with each other, not just interstate competition that tends to occupy most of our radar screen. And of course, in some ways, we are again seeing a broad mix of society types in competition with each other trying to consolidate gains and not just states. Still, all of our strategic conceptions are state-centered. So what I'm going to do in this talk is develop two non-state-centered versions and then compare them to the uh, state-centered version because that's where all of our sort of thinking originates, is how do states do it, and then we can talk about how non-states might have done it. And finally, I want to upend some of the ways we conceive strategy by going to the very root nature of wealth production and the social capacity to wage war. What are the ultimate goals of military options, and what are the ultimate limits on one's ability to make even nominal military success stick? We have long obsessed about Clausewitz's extension of politics phrase, and I'd like to suggest that yes, it's true, but what that phrase ignores is the fact that typically the very point of politics was to expand available resources and or wealth for a single successful polity, and the nature of that wealth matters in then how you do things especially in how you consolidate gains. Now, having said that I want to work outside the state model, let me nevertheless start with some theoretical foundations inside the state model, because that's, again, what most of us already know. And then I want to briefly review how dramatically that model changes when you get outside societies that are states, and especially because those societies had different underlying subsistence systems. Essentially, what I want to do in the end is combine an awareness of the effects of the, or, what I'm calling the organic economy on military activity, and then explore how military activity remains essential to the consolidation of victory, whatever that might mean. But that's enough introduction. Let's, let's get down to business. And uh, I put this slide up, this particular set of images up here, because we have a, an inability to put a laser pointer on that screen. So I may have to go over and point at things. Some sort of frequency issue. All right. Um, one, of course, the picture on the right is a Mongolian encampment uh, out in the steppe, and the other is a classic medieval vision of what a farming territory looks like. And states, in our experience, are typically farming. They're agricultural states. When I'm talking about states, I'm talking about the history of agricultural states. And a lot of people forget the basic reality of the organic economy in an agricultural state is that all wealth ultimately derives from the production of energy in fields and forests. We grow food, we burn trees, we put out animals into grass pasture. The two exceptions are wind and water. Those, those provide the exceptional forms of energy, but virtually all other forms of energy capture occurs from the, product, the produce 
of organic material. And therefore, to enhance, to increase that wealth, you seek to increase your access to expansive territorial land. You want more forests, you want more fields, you want more pasture, because then you have access to more wealth because of the energy created from that expansive territory. Now, when you, when you look at a, a typical organic landscape, this is a village actually I worked in in Greece, this is the village itself, it's helpful just to think again what, what I mean by expansive territory. This is a village, these are that village's fields, and then the, here are their forests, also where they put their sheep. So this is the space producing energy for this demographic slice of the world. This is their demographic space. It's a phrase I'm going to use a couple of times. And in that space, by the very nature of their work, they're doing two things. In an agricultural organic economy, two things are happening by the very nature of work. One is they go to and from their house to their fields every day. Therefore, they build roads. They take the produce of those fields, part of that produce, to market. Therefore, they build market roads. And the collection of that produce at the market and the seed that they store in their homes or the food they store over the winter provides logistics for somebody who wants to come and take it. So by the existence of that demographic space, an army that then moves into that territory can eat and move on roads built by farmers and food provided by farmers. And if you're not in that demographic space with an army, then you've got to provide both of those things yourself. You've got to build the roads and bring your own food. So if in this demographic space, when an army is expanding its territory, it's essentially ex seeking to expand its control over this sort of space, <coughs> to include, at the ultimate, at the end state, bureaucratically speaking, the state wants a slice of surplus from every single field in that picture, and then all the other villages as well. It's a phrase I sometimes use in my class where I talk about, to the last field. There should be some surplus going to the state. That's the state's ultimate goal. Now, here we are with our demographic space, and I want to get a couple of other concepts out of the way. And first is that we're going to extract wealth from that organic economy, and then we're going to use that wealth as the state, remember this is the state model, to constitute force. We're going to build armies with the surplus wealth that we've extracted from this space. And that could be a variety of methods. We can conscript, we can hire mercenaries, we can have volunteer forces, but no, no matter how you do it, you're going to have to use some of that surplus wealth to help pay for it or supply it. And what I'm going to do with that force that I've now constituted is I'm going to use it to expand power. Now here's a key distinction that I want, I want everybody to have in their mind. I'm using the words force and power very deliberately. Force is armed force. It's coercion. Power is the ability to rule without the resort to force. The more you have to resort to force, the less power you have. The more a population responds in, in obedience, the more power you have over them, the, the more they resist, the more force you have to deploy to deal with this resistance. If you think about the way we all more or less willingly pay our income taxes, that's because the power of the U.S. government is embedded in our system, and so we just pay that money over. Again, there's, there's grinds in the wheels there, but nevertheless, we are essentially paying that money over, and that reflects the power of the U.S. government over its own population. Now, if I want to expand my power, especially in the, in the pre-industrial world that I'm mostly looking at here, that means I need to expand my access to territory. I want more wealth, which means that I'm going to take force and go out and try to conquer space, conquer another demographic slice of territory. And then, this is where we have our problem. This is where we have to get to. We have, once we've conquered, once we've got military success, how do we consolidate? And in my theory that I'm proposing, there are four pillars of consolidation. Legitimacy, bureaucracy, sanctity, and latent force, which in my subtitle for the talk was the governor, the taxman, the priest, and the garrison. So what are these four pillars? They are the right claimed by the government to rule, established in some form of legitimacy, whether it's bloodline or democracy or, or just I'm the best and most effective ruler you have access to right now, and I've proved that by my success on the battlefield. That's a form of legitimacy. Sanctity is the priest. In this case, sanctity is a very close subset of legitimacy, but it's, it's so important it provides its own sort of separate category because the ideological claim that the rulers have access to the gods or the support of the gods is a fundamental component of legitimacy of the state to rule. Bureaucracy is the mechanism by which the state is extracting that wealth from the last field. 
What are the means by which they go around and get that last little slice of wealth from every single field in their territory? And finally, the one I'm going to spend the most time on, because I'm a military historian, and this is, again, the intellectual genre that I'm trying to forward, is the garrison, and what I'm calling more technically latent force. My force has succeeded in conquering whatever society it is I've tried to conquer, but now I've got a security problem until those other three come into line, until I really establish legitimate rule, until I've co-opted the bureaucracy, until I've got the priests on my side or my priests convincing those people to be on our side, I've got to have some forced deployment in this population to keep them under control. Because the first three are generational projects. And in the absence of those generational projects, I have to have latent force deployed to put down rebellion or resistance. Now, having said all that, let me walk you through a model of how conquest works in the pre-industrial world. If there are any of my former students here, they will have seen versions of this slide in the past. My triangles are my societies, and they're organized as triangles because it's a social pyramid, right? These are hierarchical organized societies. These are states in competition. I'm this one. As I get, as I tell my students, I'm always the king. So this is my state, and this circle is my resource base. This is my territorial resource base. And if I want to go on campaign against my, my near neighbor, I can go attack him, and when I succeed, because I always succeed, that's the other thing I get to tell my students, I'm the king and I always win. Uh, one of my first model of conquest is that I take that population, I decapitate the leadership off that population, and I absorb an enslaved population into my own. And I literally, frequently, throughout the ancient world and the medieval world, I will move that population back to my home city or to some other territory within my now expanded resource base. Now, having expanded my resource base at the expense of my near neighbor, I'm going to go on campaign for the second type of conquest against my far, slightly farther neighbor. And when I defeat them, I am going to, de again, decapitate the elite. Decapitate here is not a euphemism. Uh, I'm going to decapitate the elite, and I'm going to take some of my best, most loyal buddies from my army and put them in charge as the new aristocracy over here. And they are going to rule in that city. This city does not dis disappear. I rule it. And they send me the surplus. They're my best and most loyal buddies, and so they're going to make sure I get my slice as the successful king. Now, with this much larger ex territorial resource base, I go to my third opponent, and I say, potentially, I say, do we even really have to fight? Because you can see how much I'm bringing to the game. Do we need to carry this any further? And so very often, I'm going to get a submission at this point, where the local elite is now co-opted to work for me. They're going to have to send me the surplus that I want, but I don't have to put in a new aristocracy. I just get them to work on my behalf. So essentially, I'm suggesting that there is a three-part typology of conquest in the ancient and medieval worlds, the pre-industrial worlds. And in each of them, I am seeking in some way to control a population via those four pillars, but a latent force is going to have to play a role in all of them. But let's ask, what does that mean? And now everybody knows this is a big old text slide, so you don't really want to look at it. We want to do one more thing, though. You notice there's four. This is my enslavement. This is my submission. This is, this is my provincialization, where I've, I've sent over my um, elite to take charge. There's one more which we want to talk about because it's probably the most common, which is we fight a war and neither of us is completely successful, but one side decides to give up some territory to end the war. When you think about virtually every war in early modern European history, it ends with a slice, a territorial slice exchange. Right? And so it, in that case, I'm going to have to do the same thing as provincialization. I'm just doing it on a small scale. My, my point here for all of these is that this is what's highlighted. Both provincialization and territorial slices require me to put up garrisons because I'm now taking over control of territory. If they submit, their garrisons, their security forces will continue to do their job. They've submitted. If I enslave, I've moved their population inside my boundaries and I don't have to do anything with them. Let me show you this more graphically without all the words. This is our end state. What, hap what is my latent force requirement for each of these conditions? Well, for, sorry, we have to add in our territorial slice at the top now. We've just taken over that little bitty uh, overlap in the Venn diagram. To control latent force in the case of my enslaved population is a police force and legal codes that control their behavior and activities. We're all more or less familiar with slave codes, and they exist in the ancient world the same way. For 
my submitted group, the local military remains in being. They just now report to me via the co-opted local elite. That's the cheapest option available. In fact, that's the preferred option for almost all initial conquests, is I don't decapitate and replace. I leave the local elite in charge because that way I don't have to pay for new forces. They're paying for, for force. But if I do have to decapitate or in the territorial slice exchange, I'm going to have to put out garrison. Now again, in the long term, wielding force over these populations is going to depend on all four pillars. But in the short term, the beginnings of establishing the other three pillars, the governor, the taxman, and the priest, is going to depend on my deployment of latent force. Now, when I deploy latent force, this is where we get to logistics. The basic requirement for me to put garrisons into an enemy territory is that those troops still have to be able to eat and move. Remember back to my demographic space with my organic economy. Farmers are building roads, farmers are providing food. I'm assuming the basic strategic calculation is when I deploy a garrison into a similarly <coughs> natured state society is that that organic economy is going to exist the same way it does in mine. So when I plop a garrison down into the middle of a demographic space, they move and eat off the local farmers. Right? Because I have the same logistics that the state does. I'm bringing my army into, the, into a very similar space, and then we're going to do the same kinds of activities. And even better is if I can deploy my garrisons into capital cities, or even large urban areas, large urban areas by their very nature in the early modern wor our world are designed to absorb food from the countryside. They are market cities. That's what market towns are. The road networks are built most robustly to provide food to urban environments. And so the natural place for me to drop a garrison is in the middle of a city because that's the natural place for food to move on a regular basis. But in lots of cases, especially if I'm moving into relatively underpopulated environments, I'm going to have to split my garrisons into smaller and smaller bits because that's the only way they're going to be able to eat because I'm not going to be able to transport food to them on a regular basis. And I'll give you two quick examples. One is the English conquest of Ireland at the end of the 16th century. And this map represents the state of affairs right before the Spanish invade in 1601. But the, the English had basically started to think they were in control. The main enemy was being isolated up here in Ulster. And they're distributing garrisons around the countryside to control the countryside. Because the whole country had gone up in revolt. But it's been slowly being put down. The southwest was being controlled by the garrison in Cork. The main enemy was being isolated by these garrisons that were penetrating into the countryside from logistics points here and here to surround him and contain him. Which fails when the Spanish invade, but that's a separate problem. Strategic thinking at that point was we distribute garrisons, and literally they're thinking, they use the word bridle. We're going to bridle the countryside with these distributed garrisons. And you may notice that each of these garrisons, especially up here, are essentially one day's march apart. So they're all mutually supportive, and they're all planned to, lock, to be plopped down in the middle of a productive cornfield or grain field. So they can eat the local food, and if the locals rebel, they can burn the local food. You eat it when they're being peaceful, and you burn it when they, re when they, when they rebel. Now let me give you another example from a kind of a similar environment in Scotland. After the two Jacobite rebellions in 1715 and 1745, the British are again with faced the same problem. How do we distribute force across this relatively lightly populated and not particularly developed, agriculturally developed landscape? And you can see the answer is not the spots on the ground, it's the pink network in between. Those are all military roads, because again, the farmers in this case aren't building the roads for you. <coughs> You're having to build your own infrastructure to move your logistics into this countryside. And once you've done that, then you can have these forts distributed across the countryside to control the population. Now again, this is pretty basic stuff. This is how states operate. And it's, you can also probably imagine similar procedures in your sort of Western Civ background head. You think about the Roman Empire or the Assyrian Empire or the Chinese dynasties. All of them more or less do the same thing when they conquer territory they provincialize it, they distribute garrisons across that territory. And over time, if the territory stays peaceful, and as the other three pillars take hold, those forces will move from being distributed like this, broadly across the countryside, they will literally drift toward the frontier and establish a linear boundary to the exterior of the, <coughs> of the empire. You think about the Roman 
for example, the Roman limes, the Roman border frontiers, that's what happens after the interior has been stabilized. Chinese do the same thing on the steppe frontier. So that's the state. Now, part of the whole point here is not to look at state. So let's look at something completely different. Let's look at Native Americans in the eastern woodlands in the historic period in the 17th and 18th century. Again, they are an organic economy. I'm going to keep using this laser and keep forgetting it doesn't work. We're still looking at organic economy, but the economy is different. They're agricultural, but they're semi set most of them. There's, I'm making some vast generalizations here, but they mostly hold water, trust me. <laughs> they're they're, they're semi-sedentary, that is to say that they will spend most of the time um, <clears throat> growing food and gathering <clears throat> locally, but during the winter season they will either go away from the village to hunt, or they will actually move the village to go hunt. It depends on where you are and what you're doing. The most sedentary societies are the ones near the coast where they can, they can gather shellfish because that is a really localized, predictable source of protein. Uh, but for the most part, they are moving around a, a relatively limited landscape. And when they try to constitute force, wealth extraction is not involved. There's no need to pull energy from, the, from, the, from their fields and forests, from the hunting processes, to constitute force, because every man is considered to be a warrior. Everybody is eligible to go fight. There's no separate class or specialization of labor that separates out those people who fight. And also, there's no coercive mechanism within tribal societies to, to allow a chief to force people to fight. He has to persuade them. It's a consensus-based society. Now, that means that the force versus power dynamic works in a slightly different way, too, because rule is by consensus, not by coercion. And so I suddenly end up being wondering where I go with this diagram. How do I figure out what's the role of the four pillars? What am I trying to do here? So let's back up and start from the other end, from the logistics end. In the previous one, I started, started what we knew about the state and worked our way down to logistics. Now let's start with logistics and work our way back up and show how the logistical implications of Native American warfare shapes their notion of conquest. So let's do some basic realities. First of all, North America was not wilderness. Europeans called it wilderness. Indians called it home. And they had shaped that landscape as much as Europeans had shaped their own landscape, but they shaped it to their own purposes. There are no wagons, because there are no draft animals. And so there are no roads, as Europeans understand them. But there are paths. This is just one, the most famous one, the warrior's path, that goes from New York to South Carolina in a single road. And this is, this is an 18th century map of that road, and that's just half of it. The rest of the map keeps going. It's a two-sheet map. Um, and everybody knew where it was, and you got on the road and you traveled. You could travel for hundreds of miles along the Great Warrior's Path, and there was, in fact, regular violent exchange between the Iroquois in New York and the Catawbas in North and South Carolina moving up and down the Great Warrior's Path, attacking each other. Meaning, that they were moving overland over hundreds and hundreds of miles to go on military campaigns. So what do those logistics look like? Well, this is where, again, we're starting from the bottom up. We, what we know from historic and ethnographic records is that they carried some parched corn, and it turns out a pound of parched corn is almost as much as the calories that a European soldier is going to get for his daily ration at the time. This is a European soldier's daily ration. It's about 1,900 calories. And they could probably hunt along the way. It doesn't take that much. Where you get a pound of bear meat is almost your whole daily ration. Now, the trick, of course, with hunting along the way is you have to hunt along the way which requires diverting labor and resources to doing that. And actually, working in the archives just yesterday, I got this little quote by an English or an American actually describing how the Shawnees divide up meat in a war party that on, was on a long overland march. So the, the chiefs are actually literally dividing the hunting party's meat into equal portions and handing it out to the entire encampment. And so their logistics really do seem to be designed to not be carried is the point here. Their logistics are, are taken by, by, the march, by them on the march, not with them on the march. They're hunting along the way. They might have a little bit of backup in corn, but Europeans are moving everything on horse, pack horses and wagons while Indians are just walking. Now, what does this mean in this demographic space? Well, here's my Native American demographic space. And it has several key factors compared to Europeans. One is this 
was, that's the enemy. This is me. This is my village cluster, right? Native American societies tended to live in, in related villages in clusters, typically along water, water routes. And so they, these are all ethnically, linguistically kin related villages. They're not a state, but they're related villages. And we, they would see this zone as their hunting territory, far beyond where they would have fields. There would be fields in and around each of these villages. And then in between them and the next nearby is a buffer zone where nobody would go, or if you went, it was dangerous. And the great thing about buffer zones, if nobody's going there, is that the deer population goes up. Nobody's hunting in the buffer zone, the deer population spikes. Suddenly the buffer zone starts to look attractive. Kentucky was a buffer zone in most of the 18th century. That's why all the white people went there to hunt, because they started realizing that's where all the deer and buffalo were. Because there was not, it was not owned or claimed by any of the major uh, Indian peoples in the region. The other thing that this, this diagram means is when, when a, the villagers are dispersed, but if I come in in a war party and attack one of these villages, then all of these other villages that are related are going to rush to their defense. So I can't stay very long without having to face all of the other villages. It also means that the logistics that I've just described you mean that when we show up, after having potentially gone hundreds of miles overland, we are at the end of our logistical rope. We don't have a wagon train behind us, so we can't settle down and lay siege. Instead, we are going to have to launch an attack and then go home. And whatever happens, happens. Finally, there's no taxation system, so there's relatively limited surplus accumulation in here. Unlike the European demographic space, which includes market towns where taxation surplus is being collected and the armies can go take it, there's no real surplus collection here except next year's seed, which can be taken and is often taken, but it nevertheless is not as supportive of a, of a staying population of warriors to, to sit down after having taken the region. So what do we see instead? Let me give you an example of why this deer thing matters. This is a map I made of the Cherokee villages in the middle to late 18th century, right before they entered into a 50-year war with the Creeks. The Creeks live down here, just off the map. These are the three different, there's actually four different zones of Cherokee villages, all again linguistically and ethnically related. The Creeks launch raids over quite a few years into this territory, and we should ask ourselves, well, what does the territory mean to the Indians? Well, if I draw a big blue box over the rough space that the Cherokee villages occupy, and then do math with the GIS and all this stuff, we have 8,800 square miles with a probable maximum population of 414,000 deer, which is based on the highest deer population in Kentucky in the present day, which with 16,000 Cherokees around 1,700 is 26 deer per person. Which sounds like a lot, but if you eat all 26 deer per person in one year, you don't have any more deer. Right? You're done. You've eaten all the deer. The breeding population is gone. Which is why the Cherokees need a lot more than this hunting space to supply deer for their population. This is not Cherokee land. Cherokee land is as big as this wall on scale. Right? So then when that 50-year war with the, with the um, creek starts, it looks diagrammatically like this. We can't go somewhere and stay on the attack, so we do what I call in my own work, cutting off attacks. We try to attack one village and take it out. Or maybe one war party that's out getting water or firewood or out hunting and take it out, and then we go back, we go home. And then we do another one, and another one, and another one, until you get to this point, and I, when I first did this research, I hadn't even made this connection yet, that all of these X's are former Cherokee villages by 1750 all abandoned by 1750. Because if you get your village hit often enough, what do you do? You move. Right? And in fact, when you draw a line around it, all of that territory has now been made available to the creeks. Because the Cherokees have abandoned it. Meant they're expanding the buffer zone between them. So, in other words, very often, the goal of conquest for Native American society was to empty space. Not to take it, but to empty it. To make it fruitful resource zones for the hunting aspect of their lives. And when we go back to thinking tabularly, we see that there are only really two kinds of consolidation. 
we'll start at the bottom. Raiding operations are, in fact, not designed as conquest. They're designed to solve blood feud and honor requirements. We send small parties here and there to kill some of our enemies so that we all feel better about ourselves, and the young men get initiated into war and gain rank and prestige. But we're not trying to accomplish anything, and that definitely doesn't need garrisons. The second one is if we do this sort of style persistent cutting off attacks over a period of years, we empty space, and again, no garrisons required. We just wanted space to be empty. It is true that there will be some occasions where we will establish tributary relationships. We will hit them hard enough, often enough, and be in close enough proximity that we establish a superiority over them and they will submit. And we will claim typically not subsistence, a little bit of subsistence, but mostly we're getting exotic goods. But again, just like for states that submit, no garrison is required. Right? So Native American conquest consolidation is not about garrisons at all. Latent force for them is reputation. If you hit us, we can hit you back just as hard. If you disobey us in the submission relationship, we will hit you until it hurts. And we're getting, resource-wise, when we successfully empty space, we're getting the resources we want. And I can also point out to you that there's good... Um, I've been talking to some other Native American historians and mentioning this dynamic to them. Where very often the goal of Native American warfare was empty space, and you can see light bulbs go off in their head because, and they're like, oh, that explains why this defeated people moved. Because they were actually doing what the winner wanted them to do. They were moving. They were moving further west. And they're there by emptying space, and then the war ends. Because when those people move away, the war stops because the goal has been met. All right, now let's change theaters again. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me just show you this. This is the equivalent of that earlier state slide. This is the latent force requirements in the newly expanded buffer zone. It's in the much bigger circle now. We've eliminated a few villages, and they've retreated. So they're, buffer, they're gone farther away, which makes it harder for them to raid us, by the way. It's another good thing. And there are little red dots, because we do take captives. We have small numbers of captives that are, that are, in fact, adopted into our societies. But we don't have to have latent force for them either, because we're going to actually use sanctity processes to incorporate them into our, to adopt them into our societies. Famously, Native Americans are very successful at using what some people sometimes call the Stockholm Syndrome to get adoptees to invest in their new society. And very, very often, when white captives were being repatriated, they didn't want to go. Uh, at the end of wars, when treaties required Indians to repatriate their captives, many of those captives did not want to go. Uh, and so that there's, again, sanctity and legitimacy processes that are attaching those captive populations to the villages. And again, therefore, again, no latent force requirement to maintain that control. So let's change theaters and let's go to the Eurasian steppe on Mongolia. In Mongolia, as an example, this, especially since I was there, and I, you can see my vacation pictures. Um, <laughs> but these are pictures I selected to reflect logistics in the steppe. Uh, and I'm indicating here with the text that there's two kinds of logistics. The Aroks, which is the everybody comes along. Like all the wagons, all the women, all the herds, everybody goes. When you're moving everything across the steppe long distance. And then there's campaign logistics, which is the warrior and his horse string. Um, and you can sort of see both of these in this picture. The wagons would go when everybody goes along. You can actually mount yurts directly onto some of the larger versions of these wagons. You don't even have to take them down. I've seen this take, I actually saw this one taken down in less than 10 minutes. It's a remarkably uh, mobile object. Uh, of course, this is the subsistence system right here. It's the flocks of sheep and goats. And this is what you get from them. You can't eat them, but mostly you get milk, which is put into a leather bag and pounded either into cheese if it's from a sheep or a goat, or into arak, which is fermented mare's milk if it's from the mares, right? Um, my Mongolian army colonel informant told me that when he was a kid, his uncle was a strict taskmaster, and he had to do 4,000 strokes with the paddle to get the, to, in the mare's milk to get it to ferment. Of course, they'll do that without the strokes. I think they're just punishing the kids. <laughs> um, and the horse string here, I've got a picture of the horse. The horse is what really matters here, because we're, again, starting from the logistics and going up. What are we getting from our horses and our sheep? Well, one pound of mutton is, again, getting us pretty close to the pound of beef that a European would have. It's 
In fact, we can go even smaller and because there's a lot of fat in mutton, you can do a pretty good substitution for beef. But more importantly, this is a surprisingly caloric, horse milk is a surprisingly caloric product. If I do, don't worry about all the math, <laughs> this took a while to do, by the way. Um, but I don't need that much horse milk to get a daily ration. Now, the trick is that Mongolian horses are relatively small. They can't carry heavy loads. So I'm a heavy load. Mutton is a heavy load. Accumulated horse milk is a heavy load. So I'm going to actually go to war with four to six horses per warrior. There are some estimates as high as 20 that I don't believe. There are some estimates as low as two, which I definitely don't believe after having done this math. Now, if I have four to six horses and one sheep per warrior as my logistics for very long distance campaigning, I can do everything I need to do with just those horses and one sheep. And that's, you know, a group of us are sharing a sheep. We're killing one sheep at a time. The sheep mostly walks. We don't, we don't carry the sheep. We only carry them when, once. Um, I have an interesting problem with grass. In fact, I'm working on an article called The Logistics of Grass, which my students think is hilarious. <laughs> I can tell you that doing this math is extremely difficult. Um, no, one, no one agrees about the acreage requirements for pasture on, on the step. And I'm going to use a, a, a rough estimate of 40 to 80 acres per horse per year. 40 to acre, 80 acres per horse per year. I've seen estimates as high as 200 and estimates as low as 5. And I've sort of come out to 40 and 80. Um, this is my horse string. And again, the text supports my math. Almost all the textual sources will point to four to six horses. We're going to go with five. So a five horse string and then one sheep. By the way, they're, again, they're mostly mares because you're going to be milking them. And that gives me remarkable strategic mobility. And this is what made the step warriors so effective is that they could move such huge distances without having to resupply. The downside, and this is where I'm going, is that I have, this is how stock people talk, by the way, sheep equivalents. <laughs> a horse is five sheep equivalent. Right? And then in terms of how much grass do you need. So if I've got five horses and one sheep, I've got 26 sheep equivalents. And this is the number that I'm going to use is 40 to 80 acres per year per, per horse. That means if I take one tumen of Mongolian warriors, which is 10,000 warriors, and there's 26 sheep equivalents per warrior, and I drop them into Hungary, this is 40 acres per horse, per, per warrior, this is 80 acres per warrior. That's an optical illusion, makes you think it's not twice as big, it really is. And if you haven't figured out that what this map represents, that's what it represents. So for one year's pasturage, for one division of a Mongolian army, I would have to have that much pasture, which is virtually almost all, it's about half of the Great Hungarian Plain. I hope that's already suggesting to you the problem of territorial garrisons with a steppe army. Right? Every garrison would need a huge swath of acreage. Now, what that means is that if you can't maintain garrisons, the role of latent force in post-conquest consolidation is also reputational. And it's reputational in the sense that if you rebel, we will call up our forces and kill you. Because all our forces have gone home. If the war is over, everybody goes home, because we can't keep them all in one place, because they eat all the grass. They have to go home. And it's not preventative force like a garrison, it's a retaliatory promise. This then plays a key role in how nomadic conquerors use violence against conquered sedentary states. And we see it with Chinggis Khan, that when he first conquers the Shisha Empire in northern China, he forces them to submit and extracts from them a promise to provide him soldiers whenever he needs them. And the next time he needs them, and they don't give him the soldiers, he says, I'll be back. And he came back after defeating the Khorasm Shah and completely and utterly wiped out the king of Shisha to fulfill the retaliatory promise. If you don't do what we, you've promised to do, we will retaliate. But there was never any effort to garrison Shisha because they had submitted. It was sufficient. It also means, within the, given this logistical constraint and given the lack of uh, garrison capacity, what conquest means, what you want from conquest, is to capture people and their flocks with varying fates for the defeated elite. And what this whole chart is, is essentially different levels of de elite decapitation. Just more or less elite are killed or not. 
because you're always taking people and herds, people and herds, herds and pasture, people and herds. It's just different levels of destruction of people. And in every case, no garrisons, no garrisons, no garrisons, no garrisons, no garrisons, no garrisons. No garrisons. Because conquest is not about taking space, it's about taking people and asserting your control over them by retaliatory promise. Or asserting your legitimacy for them by successful further conquest. Because the other great thing about a steppe army conquering other steppe peoples was that they could immediately be enfolded into the conqueror's army. They all fought the same way. And if you're succeeding, you promise these people you just beat, just join us, we're going to keep rolling this thing, you're going to get the rewards while we keep rolling. And so they would easily be folded into an expand force, per my original foundation slide. Success expands, success at force expands force, and then allows me to exert power via retaliatory promise. Now all of these are differences, all of these differences in how victory is conserved, secured, create differences in what strategies are applied in the first place. Remember my original assertion that for most of history, consolidating gains was what conflict was all about. Those gains generally consisted of some form of resource acquisition, thus my title of reaping the rewards. But the rewards differ. Conquest was not always about governance, and therefore strategy was not always about taking of territory. Reconsider just briefly Native Americans and their strategies. Native Americans, repeating myself, Native Americans at times warred to empty space. Success put more distance between them and their enemy and expanded a fruitful hunting zone. There was no implied need therein for subjugation nor for population control, but it did require the enemy to move away. This meant that Native American warfare techniques would use violence to frighten, to create a sense of vulnerability. They were not designed to allow for wholesale incorporation, although the steppes nomads were, Individual adoptees, yes, but they had no use for a generalized accession of territory with population because they lacked the latent force potential to secure them. They wanted revenge and to terrify their opponents, and their logistics forbade take-and-hold style warfare at any, at any rate. Now, I'd like you to consider, at least hypothetically, the way in which Taliban logistics and notions of victory are shaped by similar considerations. They too are seeking to empty space of forces, ours, that have more expensive and generally territorially narrow logistical systems, roads and helicopters. They also deal in reputation management as a form of latent force. Taliban forces will deliver night letters to village leaders threatening them if they cooperate with the Americans they'll be killed. And they build legitimacy through the rapid provision of justice and they do so on the basis of a claimed sanctity. In other words, they are often exercising power, not force, but power, and they're doing it around the presence of our forces. Now, I don't have solid answers for you in this hypothetical about how, what do you do about that, but I think if we continue to rethink the requirements for turning victory into gains, then we're going to be deepening our strategic thinking and creating an intellectual edifice for consolidating those gains. Thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions.